Um, tonight we kick off a great series that will explore the impact the, the Boston area has had on the American diet. Uh, this will be a six program series uh, stretching through June. Tonight's program will start with a look uh, at the history of dining culture in Boston from the beginning of the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, our second program, Eating Other People's Food, will look at the introduction of foods from around the world by Boston area luminaries such as Julia Child and Joyce Chen, as well as the culinary adventuresome throughout the hub. This will be followed by a look at the influential dining spots throughout Boston history in program three, Where to Go. Um, and I just point out that actually some of the panelists from the upcoming programs are in the audience today. So uh, when you're uh, at the end of the program, feel free to mingle and find out if the person you are sitting next to might be leading a panel in a couple weeks. Um, <laughs> We'll then look uh, at desserts in program four, Sweet Boston, and ice cream in program five, The Ice Kings, which is, of course, a, a reference to Frederick Tudor, The Ice King. Uh, and our last program will be titled Final Courses, uh, which will be a tour of the resting places of some of the most influential culinary innovators uh, in the region who are now at Mount Auburn Cemetery. Uh, and you'd be surprised by how many people ended up at Mount Auburn Cemetery. Uh, tonight, uh, we'll be introduced by the subject by a fantastic panel of three speakers, Keith Stavely, Kelly Irby, and Barbara Wheaton. Uh, Keith Stavely uh, and his collaborator, Kathleen Fitzgerald, have written three books about New England food history. United Tastes, The Making of the First American Cookbook, Northern Hospitality, Cooking by the Book in New England, and American Founding Food, The Story of New England Cooking. Uh, Kelly Irby, who you may notice is joining us digitally, um, <laughs> is an assistant professor of history at Washburn University. Uh, she was very uh, gallantly going to join us, uh, but her flight was canceled yesterday, so uh, alas, she is joining us uh, via Skype. Um, she is the author of Restaurant Republic, The Rise of Public Dining in Boston. Uh, and finally, uh, Barbara Wheaton, who uh, I assume for people who know a lot about culinary history needs very little introduction. Uh, she is a noted food historian and has been the honorary curator of the culinary collection at the Schlesinger Library uh, since 1990. So she is certainly well known. So without further ado, I'll turn it over and the, the program will follow by uh, Keith giving a presentation, uh, Kelly giving a presentation, uh, then Barbara wrapping up with a shorter presentation, a uh, short conversation between the three of them, uh, and then opening it up to the floor for questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gavin. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm, it's an honor to be included in this wonderful six part series that he just uh, very delectably uh, outlined for you. Um, but without further ado, I will begin talking about the work that, of the title page of which you see already displayed uh, behind me. Uh, this, was print, this is a Boston reprint of this English cookbook, The Frugal Housewife by Susanna Carter, uh, printed in Boston in 1772. Um, this book, uh, drawing heavily on, indeed plagiarizing heavily from Barbara's informed me uh, beforehand that she's going to uh, question the concept of plagiarism in relation to cookbooks, but nevertheless, um, I'll stick with that for the moment. Um, drawing on such heavily, uh, such immens immensely popular works from earlier in the 18th century as E. Smith's The Complete Housewife um, and Hannah Glass's The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy. Uh, the Frugal Housewife amounted to a summary of major trends in English cookery uh, over the course of the 18th century. Uh, the trend that I want especially to emphasize is this one. Even though English cookbook writers almost invariably took care to distance the fare they were offering from French food, um, Hannah Glass famously equated French cooks with French tricks. Um, they also almost invariably took care to fill their works with French-influenced recipes. One of Glass's longest chapter, chapters is the one for made dishes, dishes in sauce, and this, this was the type of dish that was at the heart of French cooking as it had developed since the middle of the 17th century. Teaching English housewives how to make modified versions um, of French dishes was essential if cookbooks were to contribute to what historians have called the consumer revolution and the ethos of gentility and refinement that accompanied it uh, in the 18th century. And we can see this right on the title page 
um, uh, of the, um, uh, the Frugal Housewife, the Boston reprint of the Frugal Housewife, where we're told that among the types of foods offered uh, in the book are fricassees. You can see it towards the bottom of the uh, left-hand column and right below that, ragouts. That is dishes of distinctly French origin. And that overall, the book will show how to cook not only with cleanliness and decency, but also, as it says up there near the top of the page, with elegance. It's worth remarking on the fact that, that an English cookbook could re be reprinted in Boston in the 1770s in the midst of the agitation leading up to the, to the revolution. Uh, few people are aware that one of the most, maybe you are, but m many of the people that, that uh, my partner and I have spoken to have not been, that one of the most energetic of the revolutionary agitators, Paul Revere, did the engraved copper plates for the, frugal for the Boston printing of the frugal housewife, such as this one, for uh, the proper way to truss fowl. Uh, this American patriot had no problem helping to encourage Frenchified English cooking and manners. Uh, and this same combination of assertive American nationalism and perpetuation, essentially, of English cultural hegemony continued for many years after the revolution in many spheres of endeavor in the early years of the American nation, including in the sphere of food and cooking. Indeed, as we move on into the 19th century, despite Boston's place in the vanguard of the revolution, in the first half of the 19th century, it, it gained a reputation as the most English of American cities. It's no surprise, therefore, that the highly popular cookbooks that began to be published in Boston uh, contained a major English dimension. And the first of these, uh, Lydia Maria, Ch Maria Child's book, originally it was called The Frugal Housewife, the same title as the, the uh, Susanna Carter book that I've been talking about. And in later editions, it was changed to The American Frugal Housewife to distinguish it from uh, that book. Um, th this book was thought to have been used, uh, said by Child's um, 20th century biographer, to have been used in the 1830s by, an, by a majority of the adult female population of the United States. Um, Child, in, in this work, decried excessive refinement, which she called luxury. But even she included such attenuatedly French items as two recipes for fricasseed chicken. And throughout, throughout, she offers tips on how to achieve at least a mod modicum of Susanna Carter's elegance, even on a tight budget. Not much, not much less popular than Child was a Boston issue, was the Boston issued uh, cookbook called The Cook's Own Book. It came out in 1832. Uh, the author was the pseudonymous uh, woman named N.K.M. Lou, N, N, I'm sorry, N.K.M. Lee. Um, and she's identified on the title page, as you can see there, as a Boston housekeeper. This work is perhaps the ultimate in culinary anglophilia. Over 90% of the contents are, here's this naughty word again, plagiarized uh, from three English cookbooks. Um, and the work, con it, it contains many, um, what, what we might call suggestive of Frenchness recipes, such as lobster fricassee, uh, depicted here as my partner and wife uh, cooked it. And the work's overall emphasis on uh, this sort of whole, idea of refinement is uh, kind of summed up in a prefatory comment that the author makes that, um, quoting now, a good cook is as anxiously attentive to the appearance and color of her roasts as a young beauty is to her complexion at a birthday ball. So Boston as a tutor to the United States in refinement continued on through the middle of the 19th century. Catherine Beecher, for example, in her um, Miss Beecher's um, domestic receipt book um, um, of 1846, has a recipe for uh, uh, something called Boston cream cake. That's right. I don't, I don't, I'm not giving you Boston cream pie. It was Boston cream cake. Essentially, it's a recipe for shoe pastry to be filled with custard or pastry cream. In other words, it's a recipe for eclairs. Um, and it's based on recipes by the premier French chef of the day, Antonin Carême. 
So in both title, um, and besides the word Boston in the title of the recipe, it, we have this um, uh, recipe in our uh, book, Northern Hospitality, and we have an extensive commentary on it there. It only occurred to me for the first time in preparing this talk that the word cream in the recipe title, besides referring to um, the fact that it's to be filled with pastry cream, could be a covert citation of carême. Uh, the, the source of it. Um, anyway, in both title and substance, this recipe sums up the 75 years or so since uh, uh, you know, the late 18th century, during which Boston strove to shape American cooking and eating in such a way that American cooks and diners could mingle on terms of equality with uh, cultivated, discriminating, discriminating English and even French uh, counterparts. But as is well known, uh, mid, the mid-19th century was when Boston, along with the rest of the New England and the U.S., was beginning to be transformed by industrialization, industrialization and to supply the labor force that industrialization required by, massive, uh, by a massive immigration of people of different origin than those who'd hitherto constituted the Boston and New England populace. And if you had a chance to look at the wonderful exhibit um, that the society has going now uh, right outside the reception room uh, that we had our reception before this uh, event. Uh, you learned all about that there. Um, as these transformations that were being wrought by industrialization and immigration went forward, some people felt threatened, uh, felt that this would obliterate um, an awareness of the pre-industrial New England past. And hence, there kind of developed a mood of nostalgia, and beyond that, a specific movement called the Colonial Revival, which I'm sure you know about. In the realm of food, as in other realms, uh, the Colonial Revival was really a colonial reinvention. Dishes which had been no more than the means of everyday subsistence uh, in actual colonial days, such as bean pottage, uh, were turned into symbols of a cherished past, first by bestowing upon them prestige, a prestigious regional name, uh, and second by making them palatable, palatable to contemporary taste. And so bean pottage became Boston baked beans, um, heavily doused with molasses. Um, here was a nice glossy image of colonial New England and all its admirable rusticity. Molasses, by the way, I think it's uh, fair to say, was used rather than white sugar to bring the taste of this dish, make it more uh, appealing, um, because it better projected the image of uh, the supposed rugged integrity of the good old days. Um, the same transformation was uh, taking place with the everyday bread of the colonial period. Because of the region's extreme difficulty in growing wheat, Colonial New Englanders had eaten bread comprised of what did grow well, namely corn, uh, ground into cornmeal, and rye, which was an a, a imported English and European grain, grain which fared better in New England soil than wheat did. Uh, it was called rye and engine, shortened to rye and engine. Um, John Winthrop Jr. in 1662 described it as a mixture of Indian corn and half or a third part more or less of rye mixed with water and yeast and made up into loaves. Uh, there's no difference really between this description and this recipe by Sarah Josepha Hale in a cook cookbook of hers from 1839, uh, which calls for two parts of Indian meal, one part rye meal, water, and yeast. Um, here it is as we made it. Of necessity, because they couldn't get very much wheat, uh, this was the bread that the settlers in the colonial times in New England uh, had for a daily bread. It wasn't particularly loved. Um, indeed, it had quite a few detractors. Uh, for example, one area of New England in which wheat had been grown with some success was the Connecticut River Valley. And in 1796, uh, the Northamp Northampton, Massachusetts native Timothy Dwight, uh, who had been installed the year before as the president of Yale, uh, on, a, on a journey across central Massachusetts to Boston, disparaged Ryan Engine as, and this picture will uh, illustrate his description, dark, glutinous, and heavy. 
he was served, when he was served it at the inns where he stopped, he, this is quoting him now, he looked at it in curiosity and wonder, asked what kind of food it was, and was not a little surprised when he was told that it was bread. Um, of course, there's a the kind of traditional, Dwight was also the uh, grandson of Jonathan Edwards, uh, and the sort of traditional uh, Connecticut River Valley belief that they, in fact, were really the true cultural center of New England as compared to Boston was kind of playing behind that remark as well. Uh, but the colonial revival wanted another symbol of pre-industrial New England, so a similar alchemy with bean pottage was performed on Ryan Engine. Again, you Bostonize the name. You douse it in molasses. You can see how much is th this recipe calls for. Um, steam it like a pudding rather than bake it like a loaf of bread, and lo and behold, uh, Ryan Engine is turned into what we all know and love as Boston brown bread, a dessert-like treat as well as a resonant symbol of ye old New England. These were colonial foods remade for the era not only of industrialization, because only with industrialized production could molasses be produced both cheaply and in sufficient quantity, but also for an era of increased mobility. This was food for the tourists who were now being encouraged to visit the region, and especially for the era of immigration. This was an assertion of what is, alas, again being called the real or true America, a message to immigrants that if they wanted to become even halfway acceptable, this had to be their food. However, having said that, I'd like to end on a lighter note with, it, with uh, talking about a, a bit of a critique on the grounds of authenticity that the colonial revival generated. In outlying New England districts, this kind of faux rusticity emanating what these people thought of as Babylon on the Charles uh, was spotted and skewered. For example, a main writer invidiously compared proper baked beans as made where he lived uh, which he described this way, each bean should be treated like a voter in an election. You must understand each bean to make a collection of them. Um, he comp that, was his, that was the true type of baked beans as made in, in Maine, as compared with Boston baked beans, which he described as a sort of brown paste with nubbly particles in it, dejected in appearance. Um, but much earlier in the colonial revival period, as early as the 1880s, a writer from Rhode Island, where I live, uh, Thomas Robinson Hazard, in his uh, Johnny Cake Papers of Shepherd Tom, claimed, he claimed that when he brought steamed Boston brown bread home to his farm that he had in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, his children heartily disliked, quoting him, the famous luxury they had heard so much of. Indeed, Hazard's old Berkshire sow, this is going on with his description, had always been very fond of traditional plain baked rye and Indian bread. But when Hazard offered her some newfangled steam Boston brown bread, at the first, quoting him now, at the first taste she dropped the morsel and, regarding me askance, with a suspicious and sinister expression in her eye, she hastened to a stagnant, muddy pool in the corner of the yard and rinsed her mouth. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a brief survey of some aspects of the part played by Boston in matters culinary during the roughly first century of American independence. Thanks very much. And now I, I have the duty to transfer things to Kansas, right? Hi, I'm Kelly Irby. Thank you for inviting me to participate on this panel this evening. And I'm sorry that the weather in Boston has prevented me from being there in person. I want to tell you this evening a little bit about Boston restaurants in the 19th century. So believe it or not, going out to eat in a restaurant was not always the standard everyday part of life in America that it has become today. Um, during the colonial periods and the early national periods, Americans really hardly ever ate anywhere except in their own private homes or in the homes of their friends and families. 
Now there were taverns which were legally required to provide meals to travelers and which also hosted the occasional public or civic banquet. But as a general rule, you ate at home um, or you ate at a, at a friend's house, for example. You didn't go out to a restaurant. Um, but, but this began to change in the 1820s and the city of Boston played a significant role in helping to make restaurants um, a major part of the urban American experience. In addition, Boston's restaurants helped to define the city itself, and I think to some extent also the young country, um, as relatively egalitarian, increasingly market-driven and oriented, and cosmopolitan and diverse. So first, let me just sort of go over briefly some of the main reasons that Bostonians suddenly began to, to dine in restaurants um, in the 1820s. And the first reason would have to do with the changing nature of work. So as the um, early, early, early stages of the market revolution and industrial revolution set in in the 1820s, more and more men began to work outside of their homes in factories and offices. Um, this, combined with the geographic expansion of the city that takes place during this period due to several landfill projects, made getting home to eat in the middle of the day virtually impossible for many men, um, especially given the very limited amount of time that their employers tended to give them to eat. Um, and I have a few maps to illustrate how dramatically the city grew during this period um, thanks to some landfill projects. So if we could change the slide, um, I have a few maps. This first map is from 1807, um, I believe before any major landfill projects have taken place. Um, next slide shows Boston in 1840, and you can see how much the city has changed and how much it has grown in size. Um, next map is 1850, it's gotten even bigger. Um, and then finally, 1886 is the last map I have. Um, some additional land front fill projects that took place after the Civil War. So it made getting home, you know, to, 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 to traverse the space much more difficult. So that's one reason Bostonians began to eat outside the home. Um, second reason has to do with desire among elite Bostonians for public, public commercial spaces um, in order to demonstrate their refinement and cultural power. And I'll, I'll come back and talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, you also have Boston's booming population. Uh, Boston grows considerably in the early part of the 19th century, especially with the arrival of the Irish in the 1840s and 1850s. Um, there's a housing crisis that goes along with that boom in uh, population growth, which meant that many living conditions, especially among the lower classes, were cramped, not exactly ideal, and so restaurants provided space for socializing in addition to eating, oftentimes more comfortable than where you lived. Um, this immigrant population included many bachelors um, who began to turn to restaurants to provide them a taste of their home country and also to provide um, a hub of community um, with their fellow immigrants. So those are just some briefly, some of the reasons that there's a, a sudden urge beginning in the 1820s among Bostonians to dine out. This was something that people had been doing in cities in Europe for a very long time, but again, wasn't really something that was part of the American experience until the early beginnings of the market revolution. So Boston soon hosted an expansive but highly stratified spectrum of eateries. Um, from sophisticated downtown hotel dining rooms specializing in trendy French cuisine to cheap basement eating houses near the wharves and factories, from refined ladies confectioners to North End Italian table de haute and Chinese chop chop sioux houses, that's what they were originally called, at least by white Americans, um, and, and they tended to be scattered along Harrison Avenue, there were soon as many restaurants in Boston as there were appetites. And I brought a few 
slides with images just to show you some of these early restaurants. So if you could switch the slide, um, this slide shows the interior of the Tremont Ho House Hotel, which I'm going to talk about in a second. This would have been an example of a very um, a posh, uh, expensive dining venue specializing in French cuisine. Next slide, here you have more of a chaotic um, basement eating house that would have fed men at midday, um, especially workers, factory workers, dock workers. Next slide shows the interior of an ice cream parlor in the 1840s. This would have been the type of place that a, an a affluent woman um, could have eaten with her friends unescorted or with a male escort. Um, and then next slide, you have uh, an image of an Italian uh, eatery um, as pictured in the Boston Globe in 1894. Next slide, this is an image of a Chinese eatery, also from the Globe, 1889. Um, you might note, I don't know if you can see it, but it, hanging in the window of this particular eatery, you have, I believe, a dog, a cat, a mouse, and I think a duck, um, which tells you something about um, the prejudices of the globe um, uh, regarding Chinese food and restaurants. So uh, I recently published a book called Restaurant Republic, and it talks about all these all these different genres of eateries that existed in Boston in the early 19th century. Um, and I talk about sort, sort of... Um, each genre of eatery and how all these different genres were distinguished from one another in terms of price point, in terms of the service they offered, in terms of the surroundings they provided and the food they provided, etc. Um, now, the trends I mentioned that led to that led more Bostonians to eat in restaurants were not unique to Boston. Um, on the contrary, they occurred in nearly every major northeastern city. Uh, and it is true that by the 1840s, New York overtook Boston as America's restaurant capital. Um, but, but the distinction of hosting America's earliest restaurants does belong to Boston. Um, in fact, Boston was home to several culinary innovations related to restaurants during this period. Um, first, with Julian's Restorador, which culinary historians acknowledge um, as the first restaurant in America. Um, and it opened in 1793. Um, Boston was also home to the Tremont House Hotel, uh, which I mentioned. Um, it opened in 1829, and it is generally acknowledged as the world's first luxury hotel. The Tremont was also equipped with a truly posh um, public restaurant where guests of the hotel and local, res local residents could dine in luxury and splendor. Um, another Boston hotel, the Parker House, um, introduced the concept of the European plan, or at least it was among the earliest to offer the European plan um, to, uh, of dining in American hotels. And what the European plan was, was it um, separated the cost of staying in a hotel from the cost of eating in the hotel's restaurant. So before, like at the Tremont House, when you paid to stay at the hotel, you also paid for meals. Um, at the at the Parker House, you did not your your meals were not included in the price of lodging. Um, all menu items at the Parker House restaurant were listed a la carte. Um, and the other thing that was unique about the Parker House is that meals were no longer served at preset times. Um, you could come and dine at the Parker House uh, restaurant really whenever you wanted to. Um, so these were all very innovative and caught on. Um, and became very popular, not only in Boston, but throughout America. Um, but besides being home to these culinary firsts, Boston's emergent restaurant landscape also helped to shape American appetites in, I think, some more meaningful ways as well. Um, for example, in the city's range of restaurants, Bostonians worked to sort out and in some cases resolve tensions between revolutionary Republican ideals involving concepts of egalitarianism on the one hand, and on the other, sharpening economic hierarchies caused by the development of the burgeoning market industrial society. Now that sounds really complicated, and it is, 
Um, but I think I can explain relatively quickly. So let's use the example of the Tremont House Hotel as a quick example of one way these tensions kind of played out in Boston's restaurants. Um, now there was no question that the Tremont was luxurious and the stomping ground of the elite and the powerful um, in Boston. Eating a meal, a meal there came with a hefty price tag and required intimate and detailed knowledge of etiquette rituals that were beyond the grasp of most um, Bostonians who simply didn't know these rituals and would have felt very uncomfortable um, dining in the Tremont because they were unfamiliar with them. Um, and yet, because restaurants like the Tremonts were technically open to all, or at least all those who could afford to pay, in other words, there were no um, restrictions according to birth or etc. that limited you from going there, um, and because anyone could learn the codes of refinement practiced around the Tremont's dining tables, especially with the spread of etiquette manuals in the first half of the 19th century, uh, restaurants like the Tremont became known as palaces of the people. So even though, on the one hand, they're very elite and expensive, they have this reputation as being egalitarian and public because anyone can go to them, anyone can learn these social codes, um, very different from many of the more aristocratic restaurants of Europe. Um, besides, not all restaurants were as expensive as the Tremont House and the Parker House. Um, and this, this leads to another way in, re in which restaurants, I think, help to work out tensions between revolutionary and republican ideals uh, on the one hand and growing socioeconomic inequalities and hierarchies on the other. So by the 1850s, there was a restaurant to fit every taste and pocketbook. Men from all classes, in addition to men from a variety of racial and ethnic backgrounds, participated in the trend of dining in restaurants, and increasingly so did women. So while there is no doubt that 19th century restaurants were highly stratified, it was precisely because there were so many options and price points to choose from that restaurant dining became a broad urban trend. Um, eating in a restaurant became an experience that urbanites from across the socioeconomic spectrum shared and a practice that contributed to an emerging public consumer culture that would reshape the nation. Finally, restaurants in Boston both reflected and contributed to an urban culture that was diverse and cosmopolitan. Especially after 1870, as Boston's immigrant population became more heterogeneous, Boston's selection of restaurants expanded to include German, Italian, and Chinese restaurants. And let me pause here uh, and let's go through a couple of slides. So the next slide shows um, just, you've already seen all these pictures, but this is just sort of the, the, the spectrum of eateries in Boston. This, is, this slide represents the spectrum of restaurants in Boston that I mentioned. Um, everything from very elite on the left upper corner to the, you know, inexpensive ethnic eateries in the bottom right. Next slide shows the exterior of Julian's Restorador, which I mentioned is acknowledged by culinary historians to be um, among the first, if not the first, restaurant in America located in Boston. Next slide uh, shows the exterior of the Tremont House Hotel, which again opened in Boston in 1829. Um, if you go to the next slide, here we have the interior of the Tremont House Hotel. This represents a banquet dinner that took place there, uh, I think, in the 1850s. And then you can also see, it's probably too small for you to see very well, but um, this is a bill of fare from the Tremont House Hotel. And if you could see it, you'd see that it is written in French, um, and the dishes are mostly French. Few Anglo-American um, dishes included. Um, okay, so back to what I was saying about um, cosmopolitanism and heterogeneity. Um, so after 1870, you get more ethnic eateries, particularly German, Italian, and Chinese eateries. Um, if you skip to the very last slide here, we have an example of a German beer house, an example of an Italian um, eatery, and then the Chinese eatery that I've, I've shown you before. 
Um, so originally ethnic restaurants like the ones pictured here appealed primarily to discrete groups of immigrants. In other words, Italians ate in Italian eateries, Chinese ate in Chinese eateries, etc. But these eateries soon provoked the curiosity of American-born Bostonians who became interested in the novel foods and customs on display in ethnic venues. After all, nowhere else was such intimate access to immigrant life available. What did the foreign arrivals to their city eat? This is what white Bostonians, white native-born Bostonians wanted to know. How did they eat it? Um, native-born Americans were eager to use ethnic restaurants as windows into immigrants' culture. Um, in addition, I think that these white native-born Bostonians, particularly middle-class Bostonians, um, wanted to eat in these places because they came to enjoy the sense of what culinary historians have called culinary cosmopolitanism, um, which is basically a new form of cultural capital in the late 19th century um, that dining in ethnic venues gave them. So in other words, knowing how to twirl spaghetti around a fork or order oolong tea in Chinatown, these became markers of worldly distinction for which world travel was not required. So by the 1890s, Boston's number and range of ethnic venues had become points of civic pride. For example, an 1894 headline in the Boston Globe um, declared that in Boston, there was no need to go around the world to learn what others eat, right? So they're obviously proud that their city hosts such a variety of options. Um, but not everyone in Boston was a fan of ethnic food. On the contrary, the same period that witnessed the growing popularity of ethnic restaurants also experienced the revival of a specifically New England regional culinary identity that lashed out at the infringements ethnic food and consumerism had made on the American diet. Um, my co colleague Keith uh, Staverly talked about the colonial revival movement a little bit, which expressed nostalgia for a simpler past when the national menu was more homogenous and prepared and eaten at home instead of at restaurants. Followers of the colonial revival movement trumpeted the tasty wholesomeness of traditional New England dishes like baked beans and pork, creamed codfish, Indian pudding, Boston brown bread, and clam chowder, all of which would have been cooked over the domestic hearth. Um, the home economics movement of the late 19th century, which used the guise of science to try and bend immigrant and working class diets to its own ethnocentric tastes, represented another rejection of ethnic and commercial foods. The city of Boston played a key role in this movement when in 1879, the Women's Education Association formed the Boston Cooking School. So by the 19th century, the growth and popularity of Boston's restaurants signaled the deep changes the city's restaurants had experienced in their everyday lives as Boston transitioned from a, from a port town to a hub of the nation's powerful market, market capitalist society. Um, just a generation before, like I said, Bostonians had eaten nearly every meal at home with their families. Now, nearly all residents dined out at least occasionally, purchasing food and eating it among strangers in public. Besides meals, restaurants provided space where Bostonians could test out new social relationships and explore new kinds of public consumer behaviors. In so, doing, in so doing, Bostonians and the restaurants they patronized, I think, really did help to create a new urban American culture. So thank you very much. Uh, I arrived uh, in this area as a new graduate student in 1953 with the intention of becoming an art historian, which did not happen. Uh, but I found myself living in a 10-person graduate student house at Radcliffe. Uh, there was a young woman who was a Marshall Scholar from Cambridge University. There were two girls from the Midwest trying to live on $4 each or eat uh, on $4 each per week. There were two girls from Providence trying to keep kosher on one 
shelf in our half-size refrigerator, and there was someone from the Midwest who basically got up at night and stole everyone else's food. <laughs> and I, I had never before in my life prepared a meal. And the first night, Jillian bought a package of soup, and I'm not sure what else. And instantly, she, we, she, we were friends as long as she lived. Uh, and now her, her daughter sounds exactly like her, except that she is a professor of classics at Glasgow University. Uh, but Jillian was doing the soup. I said, I will cook a potato. And I went out and bought a potato, which I know in retrospect was a baking potato, but I didn't know such things existed. And I said to the room at large, how long does it take to boil a potato? And someone said five minutes. <laughs> so five minutes before the, we were going to have supper, I put, I put some cold water in a pan and I put the potato in the pan. And the next morning I bought a copy of The Joy of Cooking <laughs> and entered into a life in which food has played a very positive role and given me a lot of things to think about. And uh, I, I came here from Philadelphia, where we have an analogous but not identical food tradition, uh, with different crustaceans and things like that. But uh, all the food I ate was in my family's house. My mother did not cook, uh, though she cooked a little bit during the war because there was no one else to do it. Uh, but mostly she bought takeout from Horn and Hardart and other thrilling places. Uh, but when I got married, my, I married a staunch New Englander since when I asked him where he was from when we first met, he said, my family's from Providence, so we moved to Worcester after the Civil War. Uh, when we got engaged to be married and were planning for our future, he asked my, me to get my mother, mother-in-law to be to share her mother's family traditional recipes, in particular her recipes for baked beans, codfish cakes, and Par Parker House rolls. And she did that, and I cooked these essential nutrients for many years. In the early 60s, we had lived in the Netherlands, we'd done some traveling, I, my art history mind was still functioning somewhat, and I had learned that food differs in time and space. And I was beginning to get curious about the history of cooking and why we cook as we cook. And I was buying secondhand cookbooks, and I got a copy of the 1917 edition of Fanny Farmer, and there was the I found the Wheaton family's sacred tradition of baked beans, codfish cakes, and Parker House rolls verbatim. My mother-in-law's mother was a very good copyist. And I guess this is where I'm, I talk about plagiarism, and I think there is such a thing. And there's a, a wonderful little cooking try three times a year book, I don't know the proper ma magazine proper term, but it's called Petit Propos Culinaire, although written in English. And it has an extensive description of some books, English cookbooks that are front to back plagiarized, and that's plagiarism. I think when you're trying to follow in a tradition, and when being proper means not doing things differently, then copying recipes is different. And I have just finished an unbelievably tedious trawl through a 6,000 item uh, Spanish gastronomic dictionary, which has the problem of being in Spanish, which is one of the many languages I don't know, uh, and which has, shows a huge interest in mineral water. But there is the occasional cookbook. Uh, when you're looking at things on a large scale, you, be, you be, do begin to see patterns. And I was very surprised to find in Spain uh, vegetar vegetarian recipe cookbooks and all kinds of special interest cookbooks and cooking schools and all kinds of things that we think of as being part of our sacred New England tradition. And in, in more recent years, of course, restaurant cookbooks. 
like everybody else, I had more than one cookbook. One cookbook. Oh, that, that's putting it mildly. And over the years, I was shepherded by Betty Crocker and Adele Davis, the Amsterdam household school cookbook when we were living in the Netherlands, and La Cuisine de Madame Saint-Ange when we were living in Paris, by Elizabeth David and Craig Claiborne, and of course, Julia Child. All of these publications came out of different traditions, and they all spoke to various needs and opportunities and perceptions that came and went with the years. Boston is not an island. Boston has always been a very connected city, and it, it did not have the first cooking school, though Catherine Beecher in Hartford was cooking earlier, much earlier in Europe, individuals were running small cooking schools addressed primarily to young women, and this was already happening early in the 17th century. Uh, the origins of the cooking school as a freestanding system with equipment and standard recipes often published goes back to the invention in England by, of, of this kind of school by Rose Owen Cole, the daughter of Sir Henry Cole, who was one of the moving spirits in the Great Exhibition of 1851, a, a place that sparked so much further progress in the Industrial Revolution and it's very much related to it. If you look at the equipment lists that come, that you find in the cooking school cookbooks, they are a tribute to the uh, cheapening of kitchen equipment that comes with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, Miss Parlow's list for what you need in your kitchen goes on and on and on. It's as bad as my kitchen before I moved to Brookhaven. The, uh, but these, these were structured programs des designed to turn young immigrant women into plausible household servants, which didn't happen as much as they had hoped. And uh, a lot of the training of the young immigrant Irish girls who came to, the, to Boston, I think happened in the houses where they were working. But, uh, I think it's one of the ironies of both the Philadelphia and the Boston traditions that most of the very traditional cooking was done by people who were not part of the tradition. And I wonder how much this is weakened or how much it promotes change and adjustment or how, how much is lost because we didn't learn the, the good food from other countries. There were also areas where Scandinavian servants were the norm or, or and Germans in other places. The, I'm not sure how I'm doing with time. There is another sideline to the story that we don't hear about quite so much, but there are two wonderful little examples of it uh, in books of, collected booklets of essays on eating foreign food by two Boston women, one in 1893 and the other in uh, 1902. Uh, Helen Campbell wrote a book called In Foreign Kitchens, and it was published here. That was the 93 one. And Adelaide Keene wrote With a Saucepan Over the Sea, uh, published by Little Brown in 1902. Uh, they are both fun to read, and this is where I'd like to put in a pitch for the internet, because all of these books you can find on the internet, and you can read them for free, and you can download them, along with, with many other wonderful books. And two great starting points, which most of you probably already know, are Dipla, the Digital Public Library of America, but type in those four magic letters and Aladdin's, one of the doors to Aladdin's cave opens, and archive.org will open another, and then beyond that, there, there are yet more. Uh, there are wonderful ones in other languages, which is a great way of stretching your knowledge, which is, I hope, better than mine. Uh, but Keene and uh, 
and Campbell are particular pets of mine. Uh, and I may mix them up here, but, oh no, I ha actually I have a note that tells me. Uh, Ga Helen Campbell must have been a holy terror. She describes traveling around in Europe. Foreign means Europe and just a little bit of Anglo-India. But uh, she talks about the joys of going, traveling in the Apennines, and you go into a tavern and they all look like banditti, but you force your way into the kitchen and you insist on letting them letting you taste everything and show you how everything is made. Uh, she sounds like one, a lesser character in one of Henry James's novels. And in Venice, you, you walk down by, along the canal and there's, there's a woman with a soup big soup kettle on a tripod over a fire and you dip your ladle in it and you don't know what's going to come up. And this is a Boston lady. And they, they both come back. Uh, the, uh, the other one, uh, Helen, okay. let's see, I have to get this right. Yes, Adelaide Keene is the one who actually gives lots of recipes for all the Euro European countries. She predicts that the cuisine of Scandinavia is going to become the wonder of the world. Uh, well, it's worked for Denmark. Uh, and she has a lot of recipes and they look, they look tempting. Uh, she also includes a lot of what she claims is food history. And I can only say that it's not. <laughs> and it really goes out of its way not to be food history. But it, it, it suggests to me that Bostonians want a nice settled life when they're at home. But when they, are tra they travel, they, their minds are as open to people's lives as they are to ideas when they're here in Boston. Uh, I, just as a little uh, finale, I will tell you how to cook a salt fish dinner, uh, which I have seen referred to as a matter of disgusted laughter. But uh, this is from Mrs. Lincoln. You salt your fish overnight, skin side up, changing the water frequently. You put it on in water and keep it warm, but you don't boil it. And then you bone skin and flake it. And she, elsewhere she says it must be done very delicately and you must not chop it because it becomes horrible. Though that was not her exact word. Uh, and then you serve it with an egg or cream sauce, potatoes, beets, sweet beets, carrots, onions, and crisp salt pork scraps. Uh, I'm sure it's inexpensive. <laughs> and if, if you don't want that, you can have scorched salt fish, the, th the thickest piece, and you make it into long flakes. If it's very salty, you so soak it even longer. And then you brown it over hot coals. Spread it with butter. Fish thus prepared is a nice relish with potatoes which have been roasted in the ashes. It will also tempt an, an, a convalescent. So my advice to you if you do time travel is to, to the late to the 19th century, stay healthy. <laughs> up as height of refinement because it is <laughs> <laughs> at least in Europe yes oh yes the history of I think it's perceived as being more fattening, though I, I've not seen that said, but I think people are moving towards uh, less protein-heavy food. 
uh, there is more interest in spontaneity, and the French aren't very comfortable with spontaneity. Uh, it is more rule-driven. I think that I think there's much more interest in improvisation. And I think we see that on websites. I think we see it in, in cookbooks that will suggest you can take six ingredients and do six different things with them. Uh, what do you think, Keith? Um, well, certainly, whoops, certainly um, fusion cooking has become uh, uh, the, the come to the fore, um, so that would also tend to place less of a premium on, on any particular, um, uh, you know, cuisine from any particular direction or nation. Um, uh, but um, I, I know there has been much bemoaning, or I've read some journalistic accounts anyway, much bemoaning on the part of the French and their own, their own sense that they are losing their, uh, you know, their leading leading position, but I don't really know enough about it to give a, you know, an authoritative account of why it's happening. Um, I, it, d it does seem to me that French restaurants are not as um, sought out in Boston as they were when I lived here as a much younger person, um, but some of you can comment on that better than I than think I, there's something could. else. Uh, French kitchens are notoriously hostile to women. Uh, there are all, and reviewers of restaurants in France are hostile to what, the few women's restaurants that with pretension to great quality. And they get reviewed harshly. And uh, they, ha they have a lot of trouble getting funding. Uh, I have known people who work in restaurants in France, women, who say it is horrible. And uh, most w French women now are in the workforce. They're not at home. And they're not doing the kind of cooking that uh, requires a lot of time keeping one eye on the stove. I was in uh, Normandy a few years ago uh, in a part of the country I'd been in long before that. And there were all these nice old farmhouses <laughs> And the roofs were falling into the house, and there was a nice little weekend cottage built right next to it. <coughs> you know, the cooks aren't in the kitchens anymore. Hmm. And it, the, the home cooking of the patient, high-grade cuisine bourgeois just isn't, isn't happening. Which it probably is due to, um, I mean, it, it, home cooking <coughs> is happening, I th when gathers anyway, less you know, here as well, um, you know, the families with two, both of the, the adults in the family have to have, are employed, um, there isn't as much time for, um, to do it. Uh, that no doubt is true in, in Europe as well to uh, a considerable extent. One little, another little symptom that one might point to is that uh, when you watch the cooking offerings on uh, WGBH, there have been no you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my impression is that there haven't really been any successors of a subsequent generation to um, Julia Child and Jacques Pepin. Um, they are still the, 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 the face of French cooking that you see on television here. So it's another, it's not an explanation of this phenomenon, but it's another manifestation. That is all that kind of thing. And more emphasis has been placed on excellent ingredients, you know, great meats, and you don't really cook in the dressed up as much. French yeah. cooking uh, is divided in two. Men's cooking is expensive ingredients, and women's cooking is cheap ingredients. <laughs> yes. Do you see one as more leading and the other as following, or is it really a battle? 
I think it's two different uh, traditions. And this is true in, in all the European countries that are pub publishing cookbooks on any scale. Men's cooking, is, it's the same division, and you see it in the German cookbooks, the English, the Italian. There are no, there, there is another split uh, in cookbook publishing, which is that the first cookbook to be published that was written by a woman appears in Germany in 1596. The first by a woman in England is 1660s. The first by a woman, by, by, and then it was several women, is in the second, three, three, the second and third decades of the 19th century in France. And in Spain and Italy, it's the 20th century. So it's partly the willingness of publishers to hear women's voices speaking with authority about food, even if they were considered to be wonderful cooks, they didn't have this outlet. But, but I would say, I, I can't really comment on the relationship between uh, restaurant, kind of, kind of interplay between restaurant mm -hmm. cuisine and, and home cooking, because I know more about the period, periods before restaurants became that, that important. But um, certainly in the English tradition, which did kind of at least initially become I would say the primary tradition in New England as well, there was a quite a, a dialectic or an interplay, a back and forth between uh, home cooking as seen in manuscript cookbooks um, and uh, printed cookbooks and the one would constantly in influence the other. Um, and uh, um, you, you can't really, it's a chicken or egg question, you can't really assign primacy to one or the other. Um, so um, anyway, so and I'm not sure now whether that, that interplay exists anymore, but it certainly did in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. Yeah. Kelly, can you hear that question? Do you want to? Yeah, so the question is, are they eating the same kinds of food they would have eaten at home yes. at a, at a yes. restaurant? Yeah. Um, I think the answer depends. I think for the elite who are going to places like the Tremont, they're going to eat um, French cuisine um, that's prepared by a, a, a French chef the Tremont has hired. And, and, and you, some families would have hired French chefs to cook for them at home, but that would have been um, really expensive, um, but then restaurants that were mostly servicing men out of convenience, you know, like eating houses, they were serving your standard Anglo-American, like roasted boiled beef and that kind of thing. So I think it's both. Yeah, I would I would qualify that a little bit and say that from from the way I was what I was emphasizing about the sort of French or watered down French dimension of many of these, uh, these English cookbooks that were um, widely reprinted right, in, right th through into the first half of the 19th century, as well as the American cookbooks that began to be produced, especially beginning in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. There was a, again, a modified understanding of French cuisine as it filtered through the way the English interpreted it, that many of these more well-off people that also went to, went to restaurants would have had some experience of, I think, either from some of them, some of, in some cases, the woman of the house cooking it herself or from their servants, and then maybe that when they went to these, to the, to the Tremont house, they would, they would want the full, the, you know, the full bore thing. It's kind of a, a, a same division as there was in, in the English, um, cookbook tradition in the 18th century between uh, the, the, the highest reaches of the aristocracy, the, what, what some writers have called the Whig grandees, mm. um, tended to, uh, 
employ chefs just like the restaurants did in here in the 19th century um, in their households and they would have the sort of purer form of the French haute cuisine. Uh, but then, you know, the, right alongside them were the, these um, cookbooks written mostly by women uh, in, in Britain that would have this kind of scaled down form of it for, uh, you know, people on you know, less exalted uh, levels of society. So. And if I, if I could add, too, that if you look carefully at the menus, even at the fancy French restaurants like the Tremont, they're also modifying cuisine and taking all kinds of liberties with it that would have made pure mist, you know, wrong. That is all that kind of thing. And more emphasis has been placed on excellent ingredients, you know, great meats, so you don't really have to dress it up as much. French cooking uh, is divided into men's cooking is expensive ingredients and women's cooking is cheap ingredients. <laughs> yes. I think it's two different uh, traditions. And it, this is true in, in all the European countries that are pub publishing cookbooks on any scale. Men's cooking, is, it's the same division, and you see it in the German cookbooks, the English, the Italian. There are no, there, there is another split uh, in cookbook publishing, which is that the first cookbook to be published that was written by a woman appears in Germany in 1596. The first by a woman in England is 1660s. The first by a woman, by, by, and then it was several women, is in the second, three, three, the second and third decades of the 19th century in France. And in Spain and Italy, it's the 20th century. So it's partly, the willingness of publishers to hear women's voices speaking with authority about food, even if they were considered to be wonderful cooks, they didn't have this outlet. But, but I would say, I, I can't really comment on the relationship between uh, restaurant, kind of, kind of interplay between restaurant mm -hmm. cuisine and, and home cooking, because I know more about the period periods before restaurants became that, that important. But um, certainly in the English tradition, which did kind of at least initially become, I would say, the primary tradition in New England as well, there was a quite a, a dialectic or an interplay, a back and forth between uh, home cooking as seen in manuscript cookbooks um, and uh, printed cookbooks, and the one would constantly in, influence the other. Um, and uh, um, you, you can't, can't really, it's, it's a chicken or egg question. You can't really assign primacy to one or the other. Um, so um, anyway, so it, and I'm not sure now whether that, that interplay exists anymore, but it certainly did in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. Yeah. Kelly, can you hear that question? Do you want to? Yeah, so the question is, are they eating the same kinds of food they would have eaten at home yeah. at a, at a yeah. restaurant? Yeah. Um, I think the answer depends. I think for the elite who are going to places like the Tremont, they're going to eat um, French cuisine um, that's prepared by a, a, a French chef the Tremont has hired. And, and, and you, some families would have hired French chefs to cook for them at home, but that would have been um, really expensive. Um, 
But then restaurants that were mostly servicing men out of convenience, you know, like eating houses, they were serving your standard Anglo-American, like roasted boiled meat and that kind of thing. So I think it's both. Yeah, I would, I would qualify that a little bit and say that from, from the way I was, what I was emphasizing about the sort of French or watered down French dimension of many of these, uh, these English cookbooks that were um, widely reprinted right, in, right through into the first half of the 19th century, as well as the American cookbooks that began to be produced, especially beginning in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. There was a, again, a modified understanding of French cuisine as it filtered through the way the English interpreted it, that m many of these more well-off people that also went to, went to restaurants would have had some experience of, I think, either from some of them, some of, in some cases, the woman of the house cooking it herself or from their servants, and then maybe that when they went to these, to the to the Tremont House, they would they would want the full, the, you know, the full bore thing. It's kind of a, a, a same division as there was in in the English um, cookbook tradition in the 18th century between uh, the 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 highest reaches of the aristocracy, the what what some writers have called the Whig grandees, mm. um, tended to employ chefs just like the restaurants did in here in the 19th century. Um, in their households, and they would have the sort of purer form of the French haute cuisine. Uh, but then, you know, the right alongside them were the these um, cookbooks written mostly by women uh, in in Britain that would have this kind of scaled down form of it for uh, you know people on you know less exalted uh, levels of society. So. And, and if I if I could add too that if you look carefully at the menus even at the fancy French restaurants like the Tremont, they're also modifying cuisine and taking all kinds of liberties with it that would have made purists, you know, wrong. Well, according to Paul Friedman's book, which I'm sure you know of, um, he almost says that almost every so-called ethnic tradition um, in American dining, at least uh, restaurant dining, is quite different from, you know, the, the food of the place where it purportedly comes from. So, <laughs> um, sure. I'd just like to add a little note there, which is that, in, in a sense, nobody ever follows a recipe. And I was, I was testing this hypothesis online by looking at the Food 52 website and people writing in about one particular recipe, which I marketed for very carefully cooked, started to cook and then realized I had to change it because I'd forgotten one ingredient. Yes. But I also found that everyone who wrote in and said how much they liked this one recipe, including a woman, I'm sure it was a woman, who described or named herself Deansy Bat, uh, they changed, one woman changed every single thing in the recipe, and she said it, she, it was a wonderful recipe. She really <laughs> recommended it. Well, according to Paul Friedman's book, which I'm sure you know of, um, he almost says that almost every so-called ethnic tradition um, in American dining, at least uh, restaurant dining, is quite different from you know the, the food of the place where it purportedly comes from. So, <laughs> um, sure. I'd just like to add a little note there, which is that in, in a sense, nobody ever follows a recipe. And I was, I was testing this hypothesis online by looking at the Food 52 website and people writing in about one particular recipe, which I marketed for very carefully cooked, started to cook and then realized I had to change it because I'd forgotten one ingredient. But I also found that Everyone who wrote in and said how much they liked this one recipe, including a woman, I'm sure it was a woman, who described or named herself Deansy Bat, 
Uh, they changed, one woman changed every single thing in the recipe, and she said it, she, it was a wonderful recipe. She really recommended it. <laughs>